Oland of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And welcome to those of you uh, to this fifth webinar of Militarism Watch, which is a project of the Fellowship of Reconciliation to strengthen research skills on U.S. militarism and ways that serve uh, activism. And uh, we're really excited about the, the webinar today. Um, uh, a f like I said, a few housekeeping things. In, on, at the top of your screen, there is a green bar. And if you hover your cursor over it, um, you will be able to open certain boxes, uh, including a participant's box, so you can see other participants who are in the webinar, um, at least their names. And uh, also, uh, very importantly, the chat box, um, which allows you to interact with the presenters and each other uh, during uh, the, and after the presentations. So what we're hoping to do today is, um, is Sam Diener and Pat Elder are going to be speaking um, each for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then we expect to have uh, 20 or 30 minutes for uh, questions and answers um, and discussion. If uh, during their presentations, we, we urge you to use the chat box. And at the bottom of the chat box, there's a field where you can uh, uh, write in something. It can be a question or a comment, or uh, even if you are having a technical problem, to let us know. Um, and then um, if we unmuted everyone, it would be really chaotic. So um, that's um, the most efficient way for you all to communicate a question to, to Sam and Pat. And then um, once they've uh, finished their presentations, then we'll start to look at those questions and, and have some conversation about it. Um, uh, like I said, I'm very happy um, today to have Sam and Pat with us. Um, uh, Sam uh, is a longtime activist and researcher um, uh, who worked for many years with War Resisters League, is now working with an organization uh, in Massachusetts called Nonviolent Solutions, and um, has used the Freedom of Information Act very effectively um, in uh, getting information that, that serves counter-recruitment ca campaigns. Um, he'll present first, and then Pat Elder is um, uh, the, the motor of the National Coalition to Protect Student Privacy, um, which has uh, been very effective in focusing on uh, the ways the military uses tests to uh, recruit and uh, invade students' privacies. Uh, privacy. So um, we're, re we're recording this webinar, and it will be available on our website uh, at forusa.org um, after the conclusion of the webinar. And uh, we encourage you also to go to that site to see uh, a variety of tools for doing research on, on U.S. militarism. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Sam. and. Um, uh, Sam uh, will be uh, speaking particularly around uh, Freedom of Information Act use. And um, so I turn it over to you, Sam. Great. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Can anyone who does, is not muted, can you speak up to say whether you can see my screen? Yes. <laughs> okay. Great. So uh, this cartoon uh, uh, was the result of a contest um, that we ran, and I, we, we ran this contest. Um, we ran this contest to illustrate a, a quotation from uh, a particular military recruiting recruitment. Um, Oops, sorry. Let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, we, we, we ran um, it, a contest because one of the Undersecretary uh, of Defense for Military Recruiting uh, was quoted in an article saying, we have to fish where the fish are. Uh, 
and that's increasingly in colleges, and particularly in, in community colleges. And so when I was editor of Peacework Magazine, we ran a contest to uh, ask uh, folks to make a cartoon out of the statement that we have to fish where the fish are. And this was the winning cartoon from uh, a cartoonist named Petro. Um, and uh, as you can see, there's Uncle Sam with the military camouflage teddy bear uh, dangling it uh, to, in order to recruit young people uh, as the parent is uh, talking on the cell phone and not paying attention. Uh, and, and so for me, what this symbolizes is that as a counter recruitment, if we're interested in countering military recruitment, we have to, to find out where the military recruiters are fishing and where they're fishing most intensively so that we then can counter that fishing. Uh, I don't want to compare young people to fish. I don't want to dehumanize people the way the military does. Uh, but the military treats them like fish to be, you know, they put bait out and they try to hook our young people into the military. And so I think it's partly our job to try to find out uh, where exactly and how exactly the military um, is fishing, and then to develop methods and, and, and uh, to protest against uh, where and how they're, they're most intensively uh, fishing. And so that's what the reason why I do Freedom of Information Act work uh, and why I do research work with the military to try to figure out how to uh, counter military recruit, recruitment. Um, and so if you didn't uh, take part in the FOR, uh, FOR uh, webinar on the Freedom of Information Act, um, I would suggest looking at that webinar and getting a copy of that uh, National Security Archive guide on effective FOIA requesting for everyone. And I'm going to talk a little bit about today about getting information without FOIA, but it's important to know what our rights are under FOIA. FOIA is the Freedom of Information Act. In order to uh, in order to be able to make effective requests without uh, FOIA, which I'll explain uh, more in just a minute. The, the, we're not going to be talking about the nuts and bolts of, of FOIA during this webinar, but as I said in that previous webinar, uh, there, there was uh, a very effective uh, presentation about how to use the Freedom of Information Act. Now, when I'm the, – because public – the military's information is paid for by taxpayers, we have the right to the information. Um, as those, some of us are war tax resistors, of course, but still, uh, as people who live in the United States, we have the right to information that's paid for by U.S. taxpayers. And so that information is ours. Uh, we can try to access that through the Freedom of Information Act, but we can also access, access it uh, in other ways as well. So um, I want to tell a, a few stories about uh, trying to find information. Uh, so, for example, uh, this is the, uh, a, a screen snapshot of the mobile exhibit companies. This is one of the primary ways in which the military is fishing and going fishing into the areas where they most feel they need to go. Every year, the military prioritizes certain areas within each military recruiting region. This is the, actually the Army. The Army prioritizes where they most want to go and to send these military recruiting trucks there Army Adventure semi-trailer truck, or their, their Air Active semi-trailer truck, or their American Soldier one, et cetera. And they crisscross the country going to con uh, youth conventions, going to, like they go to the, a, a black student convention, for example, a college student convention. They go to uh, malls around the country, and they go to high schools uh, around the country. And in those uh, semi-trailer trucks, are weapons simulators and videos and uh, tank simulators and many other things. Uh, and they then, and at each stop, they have military recruiters there to collect leads, to collect potential leads. And when the, the trucks go to high schools in our region, uh, we have the opportunity to either counter those invasions of our communities, uh, if we know about it in advance, or if we don't know about it in advance, but find out about it later, 
we can d demand the right to equal access. And we, or, and we can do both. And equal access is a whole other discussion, but we have the right, according to two federal appellate court decisions, uh, if the military presents in our schools to get equal access to those military recruiters and, and present uh, an alternative perspective on the military to those students. So uh, one of the reasons why I'm showing uh, this slide, you know, the military recruiting trucks slide is because through the Freedom of, of Information Act, we were able to obtain in the past the national schedule for where military recruiting trucks are going. Um, more recently, they've been trying to deny us uh, the, the national schedule of where these trucks are going, and that's an ongoing struggle. But uh, what you can do is you can co go to your local military recruiter, um, and, uh, re and what I want to show you in a minute, let's say I'm going to switch my slide here, um, is the, this is the Army's map of military brigades and battalions. Uh, and uh, so the way the military recruiting structure is set up is that you have recruiting stations at the bottom level. Your recruiting companies is the next level. Recruiting uh, um, battalions is the next level. And then military recruiting brigades is the highest level. So you can go to the public affairs office of your local uh, company or your regional battalion or your, you know, uh, New England-wide, for me, for my case, brigade, and you can ask for the schedule uh, where the military recruiting trucks are coming uh, from the public affairs officer. Now, you need to be a reporter to do that, but you don't have to be a employed reporter. You don't have to be paid as a reporter. You can be a reporter for a blog. You can be a reporter for a newsletter. You can be a reporter for, um, uh, you know, wh whatever publication might be willing to, to publicize your results. Uh, and call up the, the public affairs officer of these uh, entities. I'll be giving you the URLs for these. We can email them to you at the end. Um, and then find out where to, uh, where we can protest. And when we've been able to find out the, where they're going, we've had uh, a lot of luck at mobilizing folks uh, to protest. So Pat, do you want to share your experience uh, with protesting the trucks along these lines? Um, if everybody can hear me, people hear me? Yes, we can, Pat. Well, in a nutshell, um, because of Sam's work, we were able to determine that an Army recruiting van uh, was scheduled to arrive at Blair High School in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. on a particular date and time. So, you know, um, we were able to muster six or seven parents. Um, Whose, some of whose children were, um, you know, excused from algebra class to go and squeeze off rounds, um, you know, uh, from an M9 pistol in the recruiting van. And it was enough to attract uh, media attention. Um, we got a CBS uh, news report to go around the country, and we, we got, um, you know, uh, uh, A section Washington Post re reporting with, with a photograph. So it's, it's, it, it, it it resonates, you know. It's it's a newsmaker. If you can um, get a couple parents out there willing to say, "Hey, man, I think my kid ought to stay in algebra class rather than firing fake rounds from an M9 in the parking lot." Thanks, Pat. And we can talk more about the mobilization and military recruiting. Uh, That's all. Other forms of mobile military recruiting as well. Uh, you know, some folks protest against the air shows that come out, out along and that kind of thing. Um, but so finding out about what, what mobile military recruiting acts, uh, assets, uh, in other words, what uh, are, are coming to your region by calling up the public affairs office can be a very effective way of identifying where, what their targets are and finding out where they're fishing. Um, another uh, way in which the military is fishing is through uh, JROTC, and they're trying to continually expand uh, the JROTC program, which is the high school ROTC programs. Uh, this is a 2009 list, um, but uh, it's, it's well mapped. And I'm not going to talk a lot about JROTC, but if you look at the brown dots are uh, the schools on the military's JROTC target list, or what they call the waiting list. The blue dots are where we have a national network opposed to the militarization of youth. 
uh, affiliates already. And if you can see, um, the brown dots are clustered in the southeast where uh, a, a lot of, of GeoTC units already are. Uh, there's also, you know, there's other clusters, of course, Chicago being one of the largest concentrations of GeoTC units already has, uh, you know, a lot of targets and there's others. But uh, finding out in advance where the GeoTC targets are allow, uh, allowed us, for example, in the uh, 19... 90s to stop uh, between 25 and 30 units that were proposed uh, to uh, invade schools, including uh, in, in, in the city I lived in at the time, Richmond, California. So I just want to mention GOTC um, as another uh, form of, of military recruiting fishing, you know, where, where they're going fishing and working to stop them at that point. Um, I, I want to show you uh, a Excel file that is, oops, there it is. Uh, it's, I, this is LibreOffice, which is a free program. And I know it's a little bit um, uh, confusing, and what you probably see is just a whole bunch of numbers there. Um, but uh, if, for example, I want to know more about Baltimore, I can click on this uh, Baltimore or this, this Maryland area. Um, and what that will show me is, you know, uh, is the total. Uh, what, what we're looking at here, and I'm not going to go again into, into the details, but is, is the number of people that were recruited um, by military recruiting station, by military recruiting brigade, um, in each location broken down by zip code. And um, this is not something at this point, this is 2004, 2005 data. Uh, the National Priorities Project was, was getting this data on a yearly basis for the Army. They don't have the most current data, unfortunately, but I'm talking with them about trying to make that available. Um, and then, um, but what, what you can do, again, is you can call up your local recruiting company. Uh, unfortunately, you have to do it for each branch of the military, but you can call up your local recruiting company and ask them, what is their quota? What is their mission? Uh, for the last few years, and how many people have actually have they actually enlisted? How many people have actually accessed, which means actually gone in uh, to the military from their enlistments? And by finding out uh, uh, for all the recruiting stations in your, your particular area uh, exactly how many people signed up, it can help us prioritize our work. And we know, um, it, at least in the few places where we've been able to, to, to test it out, that in places where we have active countering military recruitment campaigns, we're able to reduce the number of people um, who get who actually go in in comparison to places that are very similar uh, in which there's no counter military recruitment campaign. Uh, we did, certainly found that in Norwich, Connecticut area. I know Pat has had similar uh, has, has found similar results in Maryland. So, um, you, you know, as I said, it is possible to call up the military recruiting affairs. Find out what their missions are, what their quotas are, and, and what percentage of their quota they've met. You can also find out what their rank is in comparison to other recruiting stations, other recruiting uh, companies, and other recruiting brigades uh, across the country. And that's, that's worthwhile to ask. Uh, I want to share uh, one other um, map here. And this is the map of the Military Entrance, Entrance Processing Command. Uh, this is, uh, I'm showing you this map because when someone signs up for the military, they usually sign up with, through the delayed entry program, what's also called the future soldier training program. And uh, what that means is they sign up in the fall or in the spring and they don't have to actually show up to basic training for up to a year, up to 12 months after the point at which they sign up. But what most recruits aren't told uh, is that they have the right to leave the delayed entry program. They have the right to not go to basic training, uh, and they have that right uh, until they show up at the Military Entrance Processing Command at the MEPS station, take the oath, and take a step forward uh, from the line in which they stand. And that, that's the dividing line between being covered by civilian law and being covered by the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Uh, and, and so what that means is that we have an opportunity uh, as, counter, as folks countering military recruitment to focus on our local MEP stations 
and uh, trying to get the word out in our region that people have the right to leave the delayed entry program if they change their mind. We know that uh, there's been a whole host of abuses by military recruiters um, that have uh, told folks at, in extreme cases that they face the death penalty in Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, if they left the delayed entry program. But it, more often they'll say something like, you know, there'll be a mark on your record and no one will ever hire you again, or, you know, something like that. Um, or um, most common is that if you don't show up, uh, we'll take you to jail. So, uh, but we know that people have the right to uh, uh, leave the delayed entry program. And so I wanted to share this map to say, look, we, can, we, we could focus on our particular METS area, start a campaign, and with getting, if we get our data about, uh, if we get the data about how many people have enlisted uh, and, and versus how many people access, which means actually uh, join the military each year, we could track our progress, uh, you know, in our campaign to make sure that people know uh, 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 that they have the right to get out for the military. So this is an idea for a potential future campaign. I'll stop now and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions uh, a little bit later. Thanks so much, uh, Sam. Uh, sorry for the little delay there. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to let folks know, this is John Lindsay Poland, is uh, if you have questions or, or comments, uh, but particularly questions about either Sam's presentation or, or Pat Elder's presentation, uh, which you're about to hear, um, that uh, you can write it in the chat box. That is, um, you can access the chat box by um, going to the green bar at the top uh, of your screen the and um, then uh, uh, opening up where it says uh, chat. And um, at the bottom of that box, uh, you'll see uh, a field where you can type in any kind of questions. And if you would like actually to you know, let us know if you want to have some more uh, verbal conversation, if we opened up the lines to everyone right now, everyone is muted except for the presenters. Um, but if we open up the lines, it would be uh, a, a, quite a bit of uh, noise for everybody. Um, but we, we have few enough people in the webinar that we probably could also um, have a conversation if that would be better. But please do, um, uh, as you think of questions or as you hear Pat and Sam talk about these things, um, uh, write in your questions. Uh, and we'll have time to, for, to handle those in, uh, after Pat finishes. So Pat, uh, take it away. Okay, thanks, John. Um, well, thanks, thanks for showing up, folks. You know, for me, um, resisting the militarization of youth uh, was a, a pragmatic transition uh, because I was involved in organizing demonstrations in D.C. for many years. And I mean, in a sense, our dream came true and we were able to put several hundred thousand people on the streets. But it didn't really matter. Um, so I, I, I really think that um, that military testing is, is one uh, potential Achilles heel um, in the entire uh, uh, military recruitment process. And I think that we, um, because we own the schools um, and the military needs to have access to the schools, um, we, we, we are given a wonderful opportunity to be extremely effective. I like what Claus has to say, and I like to turn it around, so to speak, you know, because I see that this is their weakness. All right, the second screen here um, just gives me an opportunity to let you know exactly what the ASVAB is. I mean, the ASVAB, the, the test itself has been around since 1968. And, you know, the military uses this four-hour exam to um, get a handle on, um, you know, its potential recruits. So, I mean, one of the first things 
they do is they'll sit a recruit down and um, completely outside of the uh, of the schools, uh, and they'll test them. And um, after four hours of testing with eight different subject areas, you know, the, the standard SAT type stuff, and then but also auto mechanics and, and mechanical comprehension and components like that, they'll know if a general recruit would make a good tank mechanic, you know, a good tank commander uh, or a tank driver. Um, and I think then, um, as early as 69, actually, they began to introduce it in the, in the schools as a recruiting program. And when Congress allowed it into the schools, they, they told the military that the military had to offer school officials, the civilians, the right to be able to have the test for its supposed career exploration benefits, but allow people to uh, not have the results forwarded to the military. So you can see 12,000 high schools, 660,000 kids, and measures of potential recruits' cognitive abilities and really opens the door to a really rich, uh, detailed demographics, career plans, social security numbers. It dwarfs what the military is able to get through the No Child Left Behind Act, Section 9528, that basically limits the information to the name, address, and phone numbers of kids. So I'll just direct you right quickly to the uh, United States Army recruiting uh, um, pamphlet 35013. You know, I mean, they admit it to themselves and they admit, admit it. Of course, the uh, recruiter's handbook mentions that it's a recruiter's job to own a school, for God's sakes. Um, but the, the, the purpose of the ASVAB is um, to provide a re recruiter with a source of leads. Um, so you have to keep that in mind uh, as you move forward. But, you know, the military's not stupid. Um, they're not going to go into the high schools and say, okay, everybody sit down, shut up. This is a military test. You're going to take it. I mean, they've got to coach this somehow or another. So, so they, they've replaced, you know, a battery, uh, you know, with career exploration program. .com website, you'll see children with braces on their teeth skateboarding in the sky with flowers and daisies and, you know, pinks and light blues. And um, so it's pretty deceptive stuff, but it's popular among school officials. And they're absolutely oblivious, man. They, they just aren't thinking in terms of, of privacy. Um, and for that reason, 88% um, of the kids who take the ASVAB in school, um, you know, have their information forwarded directly to military recruiters. And that's because fewer aware of option eight. And that's the key here. That's, that's, that's what we're driving for. We want people to select option eight. We want school systems to, to uh, select option eight. We want individual principals to do so. We want individual guidance counselors to understand it. And we want entire state legislatures to mandate it into law. Because option eight basically says the access to student test information is not provided through recruiting services. It's crucially important. I, I want to make a quick point here. It's fuzzy to a lot of people. The military already has the results. So that's because the military proctors the test. The military owns the test. According to the military, the tests were never part of, of school records. So, I want to now direct you to our website, um, which is um, the National Coalition to Protect Student Privacy, just simply studentprivacy.org. And you can see up at the top right-hand corner, if you go there, um, you can click on a snapshot of ASVAB testing across the country. So we basically, um, you know, all the states and uh, some of the territories, and we've provided the number of kids that have been tested and the release option that um, has or has not been selected for individual schools. Um, so I'll give you an example here. If you, if you click on the, the, the next one where it says download on the top right side, you can view your own states. And what, what I've done here is um, just given you 
uh, the information that we received uh, from a FOIA uh, um, through the United States uh, Military Entrance Processing Command. And I'm telling you, it's been really tough. You know, Sam, Sam alluded to uh, how, how much tougher it is these days with FOIAs, but, um, I mean, you know, I, I just really missed the Bush administration <laughs> uh, because Obama has been a lot worse. Um, and, um, in fact, uh, we, we really haven't been able to pull any teeth out of um, U.S. MEPCOM. Uh, as far as new information in, in a whole year now, and they're already backed up uh, by a year. So the last stuff that we've been able to get from, um, you know, we, we would like to see the next two years of data, uh, you know, as well. And um, we just, um, you know, maybe if that's something you all could help us with, we'd appreciate it. Sam, I'll talk to you more about that later. But it, this chart here, I mean, it's just a, the, the schools in Ohio uh, uh, that begins with A, and um, uh, look at the first column deals with mandatory. Um, actually, the military is telling us that there are no schools in Ohio that that make it mandatory. But we know that if you simply Google, um, you know, quote um, K12.oh.us end quote ASVAB quote all juniors end quote we will come up with, with, with 60, 70 schools in Ohio that force all the juniors to take the ASVAB. So these guys are lying to us, um, you know, and, and we've caught up in, in, in their lives. Uh, and, and that was really helpful, too. Well, these guys are lying to us um, because you can easily come up with websites that will say, Cedarville High School in Toledo, all juniors must report to the cafeteria on Thursday morning to take the ASVAB. Um, but the next columns you see um, basically describe the breakdown from options one through eight. And you can see nobody here, at least in Ohio high schools, um, have selected option eight, at least the letter A. And for our purposes, hey, there's only two options. One option is the military gets the information, and the other option is that they don't. And the only option where they don't is option E. So let me move on. Now, I'm cutting to the quick here. This is a fantastically complex deal. Uh, and you can look on the left side of, of, our, of our website here. And, you know, the, what we're trying to get people to do is to send an email to their school officials. Based on what I've just told you, in 10 minutes, you probably have enough to be able to read the contents of this letter, which basically says, hey, superintendent of state schools, there's kids that take this test. There are kids that are required to take this test in your state, and um, all of their information is being um, shipped to military recruiters without parental consent. And this is the only shred of student data that leaves your schools without offering parental consent. You know, we think that we ought to make a regulation that steps in and says you got to select option A. So on the left side, we have all kinds of school policies now across the country where this option A has been selected. The entire state of Hawaii has selected option A. The entire state of Maryland has selected option A. Got about a half a dozen states that are up to 50% now. Um, um, Oregon's up to 67%. And I know that once we get the new data, which of course is two years old now when it comes, uh, we're going to find that uh, this, it's just going wild because we're at between 1% and 2% back in 05. And I got a hunch now we're at about 20 to 22%, somewhere in there. You can quote me when we get the new US MEPCOM data, if we get it. The other stuff you can see on the left side at Catholic schools. Give me a break. They're 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 worse than your average state, and um, you know this is just a, a a pretty mean bureaucracy to deal with. Um, you know, so I've just asked people to uh, click on your state, and when you click on your state, you'll see a uh, a, a a brilliantly written uh, uh, you know the amount of, of kids to take the test, the uh, release options. Uh, um, you know, the numbers or percentages of option eight selected and um, other specific information pertaining to your state. And it basically says, hey, man, could you select option eight? So 
Um, this is what our campaign is, is all about at this point. And then, of course, as people move forward here, uh, then you get into some legislative, um, uh, you know, avenues. Uh, um, I've given you know, a few legislative resources here. Uh, you know, there are allies, and um, I love them, but damn it, you know, um, half of the states, they don't even have time to talk to you. But in the other half of the states, they're talking and they're acting. So, I mean, we're, you know, we're... Just in the last week, uh, you know, two Montana S Supreme Court members, you know, uh, I've been trading emails with them, for God's sakes. I mean, there's there's activity in Kentucky. I mean, there's real movement in Connecticut as, as far as law is concerned. There's movement in New York as far as laws are concerned. Um, I'm hopeful that through some meetings in Georgia, we've got we've got th things moving along. Um, so, you know, it's a buzz thing, you know. I, I mean, the more buzz you can create, um, in legislative and school circles, um, you know, the, the more we're going to be able to do. Um, PTA um, in Maryland uh, it's great because we had the colonel, you know, the colonel who's in charge of U.S. MEPCOM in Maryland, and he said everybody, I mean, we were, he was testifying in Maryland, and he said, look, you know, you got to trust the Pentagon with student information. We feel that the Pentagon, well, you know, it's a time of war, and um, so, you know, we're against this Option 8 jazz. And then we had the lady who was in charge of the PTA for the entire state of Maryland. She said, well, you know, I just think parents ought to make these sorts of decisions. And she carried the day and it passed the committee and we eventually got it passed to the Maryland General Assembly. Uh, another one is the NAACP. And that was great, too, because Elbridge James, when I sat down with them, I gave him the data for the state of guy. You know, he's been in it for 30 years as a lobbyist. And he just looked at it and he goes, okay, well, you got uh, Potomac High School? I said, no. Bethesda High School? No. And he said, ah, oh, I see you got Baltimore City. Yep. You got Lanham? Yep. You got Bladesburg? Yep. He said, I'll sign it. People laughed. You know, I mean, it, it, there, there, there's, a, there's a cynicism here. But, yeah, there's, there's, there's a nasty racial component. As that violates FERPA, we feel. And it also violates state law. Jazzbab materials are military documents, not educational records, and therefore not subject to these laws. So what you really have, guys, is, you know, a de facto military occupation of the schools. They're lying to us. You know? I mean, they, and it's deceptive. They don't tell you what this program's about. They muddle, the recruiters muddle NCLB mandating. Um, we have guidance counselors in various states that think you have to test students, that it's mandatory. I mean, how, how else could you have an entire state like Arkansas where all the juniors take the test? Well, you talk to an Arkansas guidance counselor and they'll tell you that they think it's the law. So it's, it's insidious. And, and here's another thing they'll throw at you. Well, there is a student privacy a statement, and so the children are able to be able to hop out because that's all the privacy. Well, first of all, in Maryland, we have a law that precludes uh, um, anyone from from taking from a minor social security numbers. You see the social security field up the top right hand corner without parental consent. Pa kids aren't in a in a situation under 18 to release their own data. So also, <laughs> the entire class is told they've got to take the test. Kid sits down. And, and they say, well, yeah, you don't have to sign this, but if you don't, we're not going to score your test. Everybody signs it. Just some advice here. And this is where I've gotten in trouble all around the country because, you know, I, I, I talk up and down most of the East Coast. And people give me a hard time about this, you know, and they think I'm some sort of right winger. You know, I'm, I'm, I, 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 uh, I've laid down in front of tanks, man. Uh, but I, this is advice, and I've written two laws in Maryland and got them passed. Don't sound an enemy military theme in the schools. You, you're going to lose. I mean, this is a privacy print campaign. It's not an anti-military campaign. Okay, so so don't criticize the test. I mean, I don't know if you have it within you to say, hey man, the test actually um, there's some good in it. I've heard guidance counselors say, you know, they swear by it. You know, that kids can really get an idea of civilian jobs. Fine. We just feel that parents ought to make the decision regarding the release of their children's private information. Oh, uh, hell. Am I done?
What's going on, guys? Well, uh, no, it just kind of disappeared on me. Um, I have two more slides. Can I can I go through them real fast? Sure. Okay. Um, just a photo of Maryland's governor uh, signing uh, the the legislation, um, and um, you know, just a, just a quick quick snap of the of the law. And that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Pat. Um, so uh, we do have some questions, and I encourage folks to uh, to write in other questions. Uh, Sam has been giving, if you're watching any of the chat, Sam has been giving some uh, ongoing um, commentary. Um, and um, so I'm actually going to um, uh, unmute Kathy Barker because uh, she had uh, uh, some ex some of her own experience in um, in Western Washington that uh, maybe you want to share, Kathy, and, and ask your question about about what kinds of data are available. Hello, am I on? You're on. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'm in Seattle, and we have had. Not so much problem with the Army here. The Army closed one of its recruiting stations under pressure by a lot of activists because they weren't getting recruits. And they, um, but what we found is coming into the vacuum are the Marines and the Navy, uh, big time. So I wondered if it's just as easy to get information on the Marines and the Navy and the other recruiting branches as it is for the Army. For example, I don't see, I don't see online, I've never been able to find a, a Marines recruitment brochure such as we have for the Army. So any tips on, on hitting me, finding out information on the other agencies would be appreciated. Pat or Sam, you want to uh, uh, respond to, to that? Or I'll, I'll start. This is Sam. Sam? Uh, yeah. Hi, Kathy. This is Sam. I'll, I'll start. Um, so, um, you know, I, I know I showed you the Army uh, data, and I just showed the Army because about half of all recruits come from the Army, but as you're saying, the other half don't, right? So we, we can't just look at the Army, and, and we need to look at the Marines, the Navy, and the Air Force, the National Guard, uh, the Coast Guard, the Department of Transportation as well. Um, so uh, I will, I will, we will send you links to, uh, you know, I showed you the Army's uh, map, but there's a similar map that I could show you for the Marines, for example, and that shows you the uh, Marines military recruiting structures. Sure. And you can definitely go to the Public Affairs Office uh, for the Marine Corps recruiting battalions as well uh, and, and get that data. And we have gotten, we have received the data uh, nationally from the Marines uh, as well, but I don't think anyone has received the national data in a few years, in, in too many years, really. Uh, but we do have it. it, is, it I, mean, I mean, it is accessible. Uh, in terms of uh, the Marines recruiting materials, that is available online, and if you're having trouble locating it, I'd be glad to help you uh, find that. Okay, thanks. And can I, what did you say about the Department of Transportation? Oh, the Coast Guard. Okay, okay thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the Coast Guard people think it's, you know, non-military, but they've been involved in every war that the U.S. has fought, you know, patrolling rivers in Vietnam, patrolling the harbors yeah. of, of Iraq, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Pat, Pat, did you want to add anything about uh, Marines and Navy recruiting? No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. That, I'll just speak to the, to the uh, ASVAB approach. Okay. Well, he, here's a here's a question from Isaac, um, which is: Do these schools um, often have other options for uh, career orientation? Uh, you know, other kinds of tools at their disposal besides the ASVAB. Well, thanks, thanks, Isaac. Um, they do, but they cost money. 
Um, and um, they're really um, not as sophisticated generally as the ASVAB. Um, you know, I didn't really mention that with the ASVAB, um, you take the test and then um, you're given an access code and you get to go um, and the, uh, the database factors in your scores and then you can click around to various careers. It's actually pretty sophisticated. And you can negotiate it. So if you do extremely well in auto mechanics, then you can uh, look at various um, uh, occupations, all civilian. These guys are smart. Um, that um, that people might be interested in. So there's nothing like the states that have developed anything that comes close to the ASVAB. Uh -huh. this, this, is, this is Sam. One thing um, I'd like to mention is that every county, I believe, in the United States has what's called a PIC, a private industry council. And you can get data from your private industry council about um, many things. One thing you can get from them is uh, just who is hiring, and you know how, you know, and, and in what numbers, and in what industries in your county or your counties in your region. And secondly, you can get data on the placement rates of all the job training facilities that cooperate with the federal jobs training uh, programs through the private industry council. Uh, and this isn't the same thing as a career exploration test and you know what students want, but it's it it, it is uh, valuable information that you can share when talking with young people about alternatives to joining the military. And often if they see, you know, the fields in which employers in their region are hiring, it is a good place to start in talking about what careers they might want to pursue, at least if they want to stay in their own county. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's a tool that's available to most schools? Well, <laughs> it, it is, uh, uh, but most schools don't know it. Uh-huh, right, okay. So there's another question from Isaac, which is, um, I think it's especially for Pat, which is if you can say more about what types of info information the military actually gets from these tests. And, uh, you know, maybe there's some stories of how they're using the test to get information about students. What, what kinds of information? Well, uh, you know, I answered calls for the GI rights hotline. Um, so I have, um, you know, a lot of information that I, I, I've gleaned from, from people I've spoken to regarding the ASVAB. Um, the, the Army has um, a program. Uh, it's called the Army Segmentation Program. And, and the, the Army Segmentation Program is a pretty sophisticated uh, um, to gather data on um, an individual recruit. So the average uh, recruiter um, in your town uh, has a laptop, and the laptop is loaded with information on between two to three full high schools of information. So you might have as many as um, three, 4,000 potential 17 and 18 year olds on that laptop. And they've got it down to a science now where um, they're, they're elect electronically trolling, um, especially on, um, you know, Facebook and other social media sites to gather information to supplement what they've been able to buy uh, through commercial sources. So they have this entire, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, format um, that has lots of social and cultural uh, statistics and specific information. I mean, they know if, if, if a guy's girlfriend is okay with him joining. They know that somebody really loves fly fishing, and they know he drives a white pickup truck, and they know that his dad is all for it and his mom isn't for it. I mean, you know, they, they know a lot about these kids. What they don't know is their cognitive abilities. They don't know their IQ. They don't know um, their SAT equivalency, verbal and or math test scores, and they don't know their, um, uh, their ability to problem solve. But after three and a half hour testing of the ASVAB, then they've got that cognitive, um, you know, uh, equation. 
And it is that cognitive uh, part that is merged with the sociocultural that creates, uh, you know, a virtual portrait of kids. And as Pentagon officials have put it, it's all about information before first contact. And then, so it becomes a psychological recruiting game. Dude, man, you're good as shit at the batteries, man. Shit. Yeah. Oh, what did you say? Yeah, I don't know, man. With, uh, like, I, well, you know, I just, I love going fly fishing with my girlfriend, man. I just load all the shit up and back pick up. You, what? <laughs> you got to pick up something too? Oh, man, you like fly fishing? Oh, shit. Uh, there's another question um, I had, um, but I think Mike Diedrich wants to ask a question, but Mike, uh, unless you put it into the chat box, I can't unmute you because your your webinar connection is separate from your audio connection. I can't identify you, your audio connection. So if you can write that in the chat box. Um, I had a question around um, uh, option eight for you, Pat, uh, which is who are the different uh, people or institutions that have the authority to decide option eight. So can the individual student decide? Can a parent decide? Can a school principal decide? Can a district uh, school board decide? You know, all of them or, or you know, like I, I wasn't entirely clear. Obviously, you know, we all want the holy grail okay. of the state saying, you know, that none of the information will be shared, you know, the whole, the whole state. But right. uh, short of that, uh, who else has the authority to, to pick that option? Okay. Um, United States Military Entrance Processing Command document outlines the release options. The two paragraphs that precede the description of options one through eight specifically state that only school officials may select release options for students. Um, so students and parents aren't given the opportunity to select re, uh, these these options. That's why it's not really a public campaign as such. It's a campaign that we're running that is directed at school officials. Now. We have um, situations um, in Maryland uh, when the campaign first took off back in 2005 where we first got individual guidance counselors to say, well, I've got G, G through H um, in this mega school and um, I'm, I'll select option A for my kids. And then we got a principal to select option A for a whole school. And then we got a county. And so school officials could mean anybody from the guidance level all the way up to the superintendent. Hawaii superintendent has selected option A for everybody in Hawaii. And we have superintendents uh, all across the country that have selected option A at the local level. Um, so, um, you know, we read 6014 to mean school officials from all the way down at the bottom ranks all the way up to the top. And of course, if you have, um, you know, state legislation that calls for selection of option eight, then it's it's mandated throughout. And I have to say that in the state of Maryland, it's working. Yeah, uh, it's it's um, the even in where I am in a, in a really rural, remote area of the state, um, you know, option eight selected. They have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Uh we're still inviting questions from participants. I had an, another one, which is, um, w how do you do the research to find out what impact this is having on actual recruitment levels? Like, is there a way, or we, you know, we 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 believe in the privacy value of of not, you know, not parents and students deciding about whether to share the results. But what about the the values in terms of um, counter recruitment? Uh, what do you guys do? How do you pursue information in order to find out whether um, certain levels of option eight or or other kinds of information uh, that that is being shared with the military or denied the military is effective? You know, I mean, in, in one's own community, it might be. 
a challenge because you only know what your own community is doing, even if you're able to get the data. So as a, as a researcher, from a research perspective, how do you guys pursue that question? First, and then pass it off to Sam. It's extremely it's, it's difficult. Uh, well, first of all, we, we have two-year uh, delay on the uh, ASVAB information. So a lot of our activism has taken off across the country. And we have people, I think, really in all 50 states right now that are pursuing option aid. So it's kind of... Kind of early in the game to really quantify things. Levels for all branches in Maryland per capita have always been low. So, and I, and I would expect that they would continue to be there or even drop off. So, in terms of quantifying, um, I don't know, but I'm convinced from talking to brass at the at the Pentagon, and I'm convinced also from the way the military came out um, in Maryland, um, for instance, um, uh, when we passed the, um, the opt-out legislation, um, I, I wrote the first draft of that bill, um, and we, you know, uh, we got the opt-out placed on the emergency contact card that all parents have to fill out in order for the kid to come to school the first day. And so it's really plain up the top right-hand corner. But when we passed that, it went through the legislation and the military didn't come out. But when we passed ASVAB, man, they testified at all, all levels. And everybody, all, all legislators got letters. Uh, uh, from the top, which is really a bad idea for national defense. Um, so, I mean, that tells me that um, we're on to something. And also, and, and you know, this isn't quantifiable or anything, but, you know, in my own life, I mean, I've, I've been tracked, um, I've been spied on by Maryland State Police and NSA, FBI, and Homeland Security. Um, you know, so I, I think that is a testament to a degree of effectiveness. But it really doesn't answer your question, John, so I'd have to punt to Sam. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, your 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 question um, is a is a is a fascinating one, and it's exactly you know what I would love for us to do. You know, um, in some ways, it would be uh, great for us to get the do the FOIA on Maryland, uh, the ranking of the military recruiting companies, for example, in Maryland, just before the law was passed and after the law was passed and see, you know, if there's a difference or same thing in Hawaii, you know, before the superintendent signed and after and see if their ranking compared to the other, uh, you know, battalions changed. I, I think that it's not, it's something that I had thought of doing until you asked the question, but, um, I, I think it would be great for us to, to try to get that data in, in order to assess exactly uh, what you're talking about. You know, there, there's, um, you know, there's a little bit of, as you get smaller and smaller to down to like say the recruiting station level, sometimes it's hard to see trends because there's a little, you know, there's a lot of uh, up and down in the numbers year to year in by recruiting station. But if you look at sort of recruiting, as you look, as you go up a region, um, you, you start to see smoothing of that data where the you know, recruiting companies tend to be a little bit more consistent. And, uh, you know, so if, if for a campaign that's statewide like this, I think it would be, it, it lends itself for us to try to really do a, 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 a data-based assessment of exactly uh, our approaches. Uh-huh. I mean, similarly, yeah. maybe I think, I think one, one quick. I was just going to add, John, just one quick point is that there are intangibles. You know, when you pass a law like that um, and it, it goes through the assembly and it passes and the governor signs it and it's talked about by your law local, you know, NPR station, and it's, it, it gets, uh, you know, uh, coverage nationally, it has an intangible effect. I mean, it, it is, um, people, it resonates. People look at that and they go, yeah, that's right, that's cool. I mean, you know, we got it, we have to rein in the military and the schools. It, it's, uh, it, it might not be quantifiable, but it's real. Great. 
so uh, yeah, there's also, I, I, it seems that like there's uh, local data in terms of the numbers of students who uh, choose option eight or who are uh, in different schools and there might be a finer level of, of measuring that as well. Um, uh, there's one uh, comment from, uh, from, from Mikey uh, who um, says um, ASAP and option eight is clearly an important issue. Um, but schools that don't administer ASVAB, it's less of a point of contact um, issue for student release information, release of information. Uh, like in Seattle, there's no ASVAB, and so recruiters rely on the opt-out information from the default process in No Child Left Behind, um, because unless they've opted out, then it goes directly, the information goes uh, directly to the DOD. Um, so, and he points out that unless you opt out as a freshman, your information stays in the system unless you opt out as a sophomore or junior. And even then, um, there may be questions about this. Um, and he, he suggests this makes a mockery of the opt-out process under No Child Left Behind, that the student information dump is a, is a major source uh, for DOD, and it's the easiest one of them. And I guess uh, my question for you two guys, and it might be the last question uh, before any kind of final comments is, what kind of research strategies um, do either of you suggest or have in terms of um, uh, the opt-out uh, uh, opt process under No Child Left Behind? What kinds of information um, are people looking for or is there available and how do, how do you guys go at it from a research perspective in order to understand that better? Uh, if you want, I could start, but uh, could I Sam. show my desktop? Uh, Donna, sure. Can I yeah, show my sure. desktop? Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll start talking while we're, we're doing the switch. Um, hey, buddy. Here it is. Okay, good. Um, so um, the, the most important thing, I think, for uh, effective opt-out campaigns is the, to, to realize that, at least in my experience, opt-out campaigns that focus on getting parents to opt students out have had limited effectiveness. But opt-out campaigns in which students um, uh, campaign, you know, opt themselves out and in which students try to get other students to get students to sign saying, I don't want my information released, uh, can be much, much more effective. And uh, so, you, you know, the, the text is, uh, of the law, first of all, is very important. So, you know, you know here's the text of the law, uh, Public Law 107-110, and what it says in part two, under consent, it says a secondary school, that's the bolded part, a secondary school student or the parent of the student may request that the student's name, address, and telephone listing described in paragraph one not be released. So it says a secondary school student or the parent. So, you know, we've had a, a lot of misinformation out there that says only students over 18 can, can request, can, can opt out. That's not true because the law says the secondary student themselves uh, can do the opting out. And this has been confirmed by the Department of Education's Family Compliance Office um, uh, where they said, we have determined that a school must honor a request made by a student who took the initiative to tell a school not to disclose his or her name, address, and telephone number to military recruiters. So, um, you know, I, I know in Hartford, Connecticut, for example, there was a campaign led by uh, former child soldiers from Liberia and Sierra Leone who uh, urged students to opt out because they knew what the realities of war were like and, it, and, and, and they didn't want anyone else to experience the war, the horrors of war that they had experienced. Um, and so in Hartford, what they did was they got students to notify other students and, 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 and had students were challenging other students to sign the opt out forms. And then um, they got the data about how many students opted out from each high school and they held a Hartford-wide student party at the end of the opt-out party, which was a sort of a you know, celebration of opt-out party and they sort of gave a, you know, awards to the schools that had the highest rate of opting out and that kind of thing. So that, that's the best use of opt-out data that, that I know of, but it it's all comes back to using uh, the fact that students, organizing students, 
to opt themselves out. And that's, I think, where opt-out campaigns could become uh, much more effective than uh, they have been in some places where it just relies on parents. Right. Pat, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, can I ask? Yeah, yeah I will. Um, I think that the um, an opt-out campaign would be more, more effective the joint advertising and marketing research uh, system, um, which is a database of, um, I don't know, something like 24 million kids between the age of um, uh, 16 and 24, I believe. And the Jammers database um, is the, the, you know, the grandfather of all databases. All the ASVAB information goes into um, Jammers, all the opt-out information information goes into jammers and you know all the stuff that they collect from uh, um, from other sources fall into jammers too so you know like ring companies and yearbook companies and things of that nature so um, I think that uh, there are opt-out campaigns uh, directed toward jammers um, I think that's a more worthwhile um, effort to go after the jammers opt-out than than simply the um, no child left behind Section 9528 um, uh, opt out because that's simply limited to the name, address, and phone number. And I believe that most recruiters um, already have that information from multi multiple sources. Well, it sounds like uh, you guys have uh, set us up for some uh, challenges uh, to do research uh, in, in ways that would uh, serve counter recruitment. Uh, in addition to all the great work that you've been doing with uh, FOIA and, uh, and ASVAB uh, strategies. So um, that concludes our hour. And uh, as I mentioned before, this webinar was recorded and will be available on our website at forusa.org. I want to thank um, Pat and Sam for your presentations and all your work. And um, thanks, everyone, for participating and tuning in. So th thank you, everybody. I just want to say, uh, if you could, uh, either in the chat box before you leave, you know, ideally, or email to, I guess, to, to you, John, uh, any feedback, anything that was, you know, about what was most useful to you about this presentation or what you're still looking to find out, I, it would be great to hear. Great. Thanks. And um, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to go off of uh, our we're going to go off ourselves now, but um, we'll leave this up on uh, for a few more minutes if you want to take down any of the information. So thanks so much, and take care. <laughs>